what I want to do is say a word about uh, uh, the dissertation fellows sort of program at the AIPCT. So for those of you who are new to this, the American Institute of Philosophical and Cultural Thought uh, welcomes dissertation scholars. Uh, and if you go to our website, which is AmericanPhilosophy.net, you will see a whole list of folks who have come uh, to uh, to finish and study their dissertations uh, here at the AIPCT to be in residence. And we generally ask them, there's only been one exception due to COVID. Uh, <laughs> someone had to leave two weeks early in order to be able to leave at all. But uh, uh, pretty much every resident we've ever had to work on dissertation has given a residency lecture. And that is what we are here for today. Uh, today's victim <laughs> is Andrea. Who is a PhD student at the uh, Polish Academy of Sciences in Warsaw, a very fine and prestigious institution? Uh, and uh, she'll tell you everything you need to know about uh, what she's working on. However, the paper that she's presenting today is not part of her dissertation. It's, uh, it's an earlier piece that she did for a book that actually a number of us in this room contributed to. And she, she can, you already read about it on the website or the Facebook page, I'm sure. All right, so uh, with that said, I do want to acknowledge uh, the presence of a number of fellows of the AIPCT right at the moment. Uh, and uh, most importantly, Ken Stickers, who is a senior fellow of the AIPCT, chair of the philosophy department at Southern Illinois University Carbondale. And Ken is going to be giving a response today to Helen's talk. Uh, well, that's right, it's right up Ken's alley. This is, this is, this is what Ken does. And so, uh, so I'm pleased that he was uh, willing to come. And actually, he's been consulting with Helen during her residency here about her work. Over fried chicken. Over fried chicken. <laughs> uh, I had not really noticed it in, in my rather extensive time in Poland, but you really can't get fried chicken in Poland. Uh, or not, well, if they think Kentucky fried chicken is is fried chicken. It's like, no, you need to stay away from that place. But, <laughs> but anyway, yeah, 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 yeah. So, uh, so there has been there has been fried chicken during the residency. Um, I I eat it so rarely that I didn't miss it in Poland. Um, anyway, but it is awfully good. Uh, so we took Helen to Memphis, and she had Gus's fried chicken there, which is this world famous spicy fried chicken. Mm. It was pretty good. All right, so. So uh, a number of the fellows are here, and in particular, in the room, <laughs> uh, we, we're, we're hybrid. This is our first hybrid event since COVID, so there's one, two, three, four, five, six, including me, uh, and uh, seven, including Ken, folks in the room. And so when it comes time for the question, eight, eight. <laughs> including me. Oh, well, oh, okay, yeah, that's true, yeah. <laughs> I, it's a given. It's a given. So uh, I see uh, Anne Marie just shows up. All right. So uh, hello. So I'm going to uh, um, turn it over to Helen. Uh, and uh, uh, pretty much the the only thing that I want to say further, in the way, uh, by way of introduction, is that I met Helen in Warsaw. Uh, she's as you'll discover, she's she's only Polish by by courtesy. She actually grew up in Boston and. Sounds, sounds just like she's from Boston. Uh, and so you won't hear a Polish accent if you're disappointed in that. But her parents were Polish. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so, but she's lived in Warsaw for over 30 years. And she was one of the people who sort of helped the Poles put together their financial and banking, their private. Now, don't sector. say that because everybody will hate you. <laughs> <laughs> I did yeah. not do that. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, yeah, they know how to who to blame for it. But anyway, she she spent her her career in finance, essentially helping Poland, uh, along with you know numerous other people doing the same thing, helping Poland create a post-communist. Can can I, I, I can I, I use the word capitalist <laughs> capitalist yeah, economy? Yeah. Okay, all right. No, uh, I I mean. And having and and uh, and having done that, uh, uh, she retired and decided that she needed to undo the damage that had been done by becoming a, an <laughs> academic. <laughs> and so, uh, so anyway, with that said, uh, I'm going to have to mute myself, uh, but uh, because we can only have one mic open in this room at a time. Um, okay. Um. Hello, everyone. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm not um, an accomplished presenter like like Rand, uh, so please forgive me. Hopefully, as I warm up, I'll get less nervous. 
Uh, before I start my presentation, I just wanted to thank Randy, my I think my bodhisattva, for <laughs> for um, first of all, I've never been anybody's you know, wow. I think you've been many people's bodhisattva, <laughs> but um, but um, for giving the opportunity to contribute to uh, the book that is coming out, I believe at the end very of the soon, year, very soon. yeah, which is um, the power of personal objects in which I was able to contribute a chapter. Um, he's also, thank you for uh, you know, giving me the opportunity of coming here and meeting this exceptional, thriving community of intelligent and very interesting people. Um, uh, it, it's been wonderful. And, um, and, and thank you for allowing me to make this presentation. Uh, so with that, I, I have some PowerPoints so that I, hopefully I don't lose you. I'm going to try to get that on, or maybe not uh, here. So the, uh, the title of my um, chapter and of this presentation, which ha I, it's half the size of the chapter um, at least, is called, Have We Effectively Made Money a Person and Ourselves Its Corporeal Embodiment? My presentation will have five parts. Um, introduction, money, personhood, money and personhood and conclusions. So I'll start with the introduction. Adam Smith's iconic description of money's origins, that man's natural instinct to truck and barter gave rise to money as an efficient medium of exchange continues to inform our social imaginary. It underpins our attitude towards money and indeed remains a fundamental tenet of orthodox economists. As a result, we tend to treat money not as a bearer of its own independent powers, but as a neutral facilitator of transactions. At the same time, we often experience the uncanny phenomenon of seeing ourselves as a reflection of our money in our social interactions. I quote Marx, Marx, who captured it well. That for which I pay, that for which money can buy, that am I the possessor of money. Thus, what I am and am capable of is by no means determined by my individuality. I am ugly, but I can buy myself the most beautiful of women. Therefore, I am not ugly, but the effect of my ugliness is its deterrent power is nullified by money. I, as an individual, am lame, but money furnishes me with 24 feet, end quote. What are the sources of these contradictory and unreconciled perceptions of money? I consider whether, as a society, we might have unwittingly turned money into a person, as Marx implied. I will explore how our social imaginary is built upon three flawed beliefs that enable such a reality. One, that money is a naturally arising and neutral tool in economic transactions. Two, that our economic system respects the law kin rights of life, liberty, and property. And three, that the free individual is the foundation of our social and economic system. As I said before, I will exposit my assertion in three sections. The first money describes money's forms and functions and the two main theories of money, the orthodox commodity theory. What? Didn't switch. Oh, I'm, 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 I'm not ready to switch oh, okay. yet, but thank you. And thank you. And the <laughs> heterodox credit theory. The second section, personhood, describes how this concept evolved over time and how within our own, uh, how our own understanding is embedded, within our own understanding is embedded the idea of a free individual as the basis of society, as well as the Lockean notion of natural rights. The third section is my attempt to synthesize or perhaps deconstruct notions of money and personhood. I will then conclude. So, the first section and the longest section is money. I start by briefly describing the evolution of the various forms and functions of money and how it has affected our perception of it. Money forms. For over 2000 years, money was tied to a commodity that was considered inherently valuable. It often took the form of metal coins. In, this, in 17th century Europe, paper notes that were convertible to gold appeared. These were essentially IOUs, that is, promises to pay the metal on demand. 
goldsmiths initially issued these notes to spare clients the inconvenience of physically moving gold when settling transactions. Since conversion calls for the store gold were unlikely to all occur at once, the goldsmith could issue notes in excess of gold in his possession. By doing so, he was in fact creating credit money ex nihilo. The gold did not need to equal the notes issued as long as there was confidence of conversion on demand. In the same manner, banks also began to lend, to lend money in excess of actual deposits, also creating money ex nihilo. This created money was redeposited and formed the basis of yet another cycle of lending or fractional banking. This money creation was not apparent in social discourse. The perception of money as a precious commodity obscured the fact that credit often created a fungible money counterpart. For all intents and purposes, credit money, although merely derivative of commodity money, performed the same function. In social discourse, we tend to treat commodity money or proper money and credit money as two ontologically different substances having two different natures, as opposed to being on a hierarchical continuum of what sociologist Jeffrey Ingham coined moneyness. Money created by credit often led a ghostly existence with the exception of a brief spell of Keynesian policies and for all intents and purposes was treated by the public as being a direct representation of a commodity. This is exemplified by the fact the banks were and continue to be popular, popularly referred to as money intermediaries, implying that they help to allocate existing money and not actually creating it. In 1971, the already attenuated legal link between money and gold was severed by Nixon. The dollar became the ultimate source of value on the basis of the US government's guarantee. Since then, almost all money is fiat money. Missing from social discourse is the fact that any state government is guarantee is self-referential. Also absent is that most circulating money continues to be credit money and is not issued by the government. Um, I move on to money functions. There are four main functions of money as we typically see it. The first two arguably dominate our common perceptions of what money is and our commodity lens gives them an appearance of neutrality. The first is a medium of exchange. Oh wait, did I? No, I'm on the right slide, sorry. That is a token that is universally accepted in exchange for all other commodities. Second, a store of value. The same token all can also be saved, retrieved, and exchanged at a later time at a relatively predictable value. The next two functions are subtler and arguably escape our day-to-day -day experience of money. Um, so then there's the unit of account, which is the countable thing un under a universal standard of value, which enables comparisons of different things. And fourth, a means of deferred and ultimate payment a way of settling accounts between debtors and creditors, which involves an element of time. So from um, forms and functions, I move on to the theories, commodity theories of money. Uh, the notion of money as a commodity began with Aristotle and was popularized by Smith when he said that the human tendency to trade gave rise to money, which served to avoid the double coincidence of wants and barter. Smith thought that the natural value of money, like other commodities, arose from the labor costs of producing it. Prices simply reflected the labor value of money relative to other commodities. While supply and demand conditions in the short run may veer the market price away from this natural price, they tend towards it in the long run. However, Smith's theorizing about value was circular and remained unresolved by the classical economists that followed him. In the late 1800s, neoclassical economists established two tenets that continued to underpin contemporary orthodox theorizing. First, they rejected labor theory. Prices were now co-determined by the interplay of marginal utilities of rational individuals and the quantity of money. Second, 
they formalized a general equilibrium theory that remained grounded in Smith's supply and demand conditions of a barter economy where money remains a neutral economy, a commodity. Carl Menger provided the school's definitive explanation of money. It is the unintended consequence of individual rationality in that it serves to reduce transaction costs. It is a byproduct that merely simplifies what is already happening without it. It is a neutral veil that doesn't affect the real economy of goods and services. Commodity money remains conventional wisdom. The very term free market implies that money and prices freely and neutrally reflect supply and supply and demand decisions of uncoerced individuals. However, this vision fails to adequately answer basic questions about money. Uh, what, it, what is it, what it is, how it originated and how it gets its value. So I move on to problems with commodity theories of money. First, spontaneous emergence from barter does not explain how a single commodity arises as a medium of exchange that is universally accepted. A self-interested rational individual would not exchange goods for a useless coin unless he believed others would similarly value and accept it. He would only use money if it were already a viable institution. Prior to serving as a medium of exchange, money needs to be somewhat stabilized as a unit of account. Otherwise, its unanchored value could unpredictably alter from one bilateral transaction to another. But in this case, how does a universal unit of account emerge spontaneously? According to heterodox economist L. Randall Ray, spontaneous order theory cannot explain multilateral and temporal transactions, including those of wage labor, capital investments, and debt contracts that underpin capitalist accumulation. A second unresolved issue is that commodity theory does not coherently explain credit money. Orthodox economists must maintain an ontological distinction between commodity money and credit money. Credit money clearly reflects a social relation and is incompatible with the idea of money as commodity. The fact that credit money is the key to capitalist accumulation underscores the importance of this unresolved issue or overlooked issue. Finally, commodity theory is historically unsupported. There is no anthropological evidence of any barter-based origins of money, but plenty for the state establishment of money, with the earliest evidence found in Babylon and Egypt. In medieval Europe, debt recorded on notched wooden tallies were also commonly used and traded. Economist Mitchell Ines asserted that the primary purpose of Europe's famous medieval markets was to settle debts. Barter was merely a secondary function. <clears throat> so from commodity money, I'll move on to credit theories of money. An alternative approach to money presents it as a debt contract of formal IOU. The state theory of money posits that the state incurs the original debt that establishes money and imposes taxes in the unit of account of its debt, which creates demand for the money. Money, even in the form of gold, is simply the state's own promise to pay and which is ultimately offset by taxation. This creates the circulation of money within the state's money space. The fact that the state accepts its own IOUs validates money and establishes its base value. Precious metals have no intrinsic value unless it is assigned. Money logically precedes markets and actually creates conditions for them. First, money and prices are established. Then, markets develop in order for individuals to acquire money to meet their tax obligations by selling goods and services. In other words, a monetized economy is irreducibly political. It arises together with political authority. Keynes explicitly asserted that while barter is bilateral, money presupposes a tripartite relationship. It requires an authority to establish money's universality by transferring, transforming a token of from a personal object of trust into an impersonal one that is transferable. Furthermore, <clears throat> the modern capitalist system is a hierarchical one ordered by a specific form of money. 
Its unique feature is an institutional mechanism that turns the banking system's private debt into universally acceptable tokens. When the central bank discounts bank loans, it converts them into the most desired IOUs at the top of the hierarchy of debt, government notes which are legal tender. Thus, the social relation of debt is hierarchically ordered by those who can create credit money and those who can access it. Both the state and private banks create credit money and grant access in a constantly negotiated relationship between them. Um, this ends the longest section on money, and I move on to a much uh, shorter section on personhood. <laughs> We tend to perceive personhood as an attribute of all humans, which among other things entitles each of us to the natural rights of life, liberty, and property. These rights seem self-evident to us and are legally underpinned by the 14th Amendment, which requires due process when they are threatened. However, like money, personhood is a socially determined concept that, um, that is made effective through institutions such as the legal system. It too has evolved through time. Our contemporary tendency to associate personhood with specific natural rights was greatly influenced by law. The timing is uh, closely coincides with the establishment of the Bank of England, the moment when state monetization of private debt first became possible on a large scale. Perhaps this was more than just a coincidence. Personhood as an evolving concept. Persona has origins in the Etruscan and Greek words for mask. In Rome under Justinian, a legal status was attached to persona, making it a Roman citizen and the subject of legal rights and duties. It was through the legal persona that rights became enforceable and effective. Although the Romans associated persona with humans, not every human was a person. Women, children, slaves, and foreigners were excluded. Persona was the public face attached to certain humans, and it was directly tied to their status in society. Status was in turn determined by the family and personal relations arising from it, as well as property, which was inextricably linked to one's sovereignty or freedom to act. In the Middle Ages, the Christian church linked persona to the soul, and in this matter, manner did extend it to all human beings. Aquinas eventually linked the soul to reason, which he treated as an essential feature of personhood. The Christian focus on the immaterial provided the basis for further extending a person to the corporate body, a group person expressing collective reason. While initially the corporate person applied only to church institutions, it was eventually extended to the commercial world in the 17th century. This period also saw the basis of personhood shift from status to contract as noted by Henry Maine. Traditionally, imposed relations of obligations and rights resulting from status and hierarchy uh, were gradually replaced by obligations entered into by individuals. Over time, the individual supplanted the family as the unit taken into account by the law, and the contract replaced forms of reciprocity and rights and duties based on family status. One might say that contract made personhood impersonal. Increasingly, the social order came to result from contracts between individuals. This tendency from status to contract was exemplified by England's glorious revolution of 1688, legitimated by Locke's social contract and its parliament's subsequent declaration of right, whereby the supremacy of impersonal law officially took precedence over the personal monarch. It was at this time that Locke proposed his image of men as free and rational individuals, one that continues to dominate our social imaginary. Locke asserted that in the state of nature, men were born into quote, a state of perfect freedom to order their actions and dispose of their possessions and persons as they think fit." End quote. The right to life was foundational, enabling men to make use of the things necessary to his man to make use of things necessary to his being. 
the derivative rights to liberty and property supported him in this task of self-preservation. The right to liberty ensured freedom from the arbitrary will of others and the right to property bestowed upon him the unilateral ability to appropriate the fruits of the earth and the earth itself. Man was no longer indebted to society for his livelihood as is traditionally the case. Instead, society was created by free individuals primarily to benefit themselves. Ownership was an important precondition of the new order and enabled individuals to enter contracts with others. And through ownership, society itself could be construed as a set of contractual relationships. The sovereign state was the result of a social contract entered into by free individuals to protect their property. Commodities were sold in markets via exchange contracts. Importantly, Locke developed the notion of self-ownership, whereby every individual is the proprietor of his body, words, and actions, and accordingly could enter into wage contracts, among other things. Contracts became the basis of legal rights, and legal persons were those that could enter into them. In essence, the contract made rights effective. This seemed an intuitively acceptable proposition because individuals were also conceived as free. Our conception of ourselves as free individuals with natural rights is so powerfully established as to be largely unquestioned. Americans have been apt to accept economic inequality, to accept economic inequality as reflecting each individual's individual, uh, industriousness and choices and therefore something that he directly controls. Less obvious is the fact that the rights of liberty and property are not universal and the legal system based on personhood and contract are effectively limited to protecting the rights of those who already possess them. Our contemporary understanding of the right to property and what is actually protected by law is the right not to have our already owned property interfered with. This actually conflates uh, Law's right to property, which he defined as the unilateral right to the use of the earth to ensure one's survival, with Locke's natural law or universal prohibition against interfering with another's property. In a society like our own, where the most life-preserving property has been appropriated, only those with property have the right to property in the original Lockean sense, and then it is indeed well protected. The dispossessed, who can only rely on their bodies and unnecessarily mediated access to the earth, no longer have the right to property. The right not to have our property interfered with is formally universal. However, only property owners benefit from the protection. The state of affairs is further rationalized by our adoption of Locke's intuitively appealing justification of property. It was through one's labor that one could unilaterally appropriate common land in the first place. Thus, we accept the inequalities, including dispossession, result from our own efforts and free choices. However, the loss of property rights has follow on consequences for the very freedom that we perceive we have. The fact that property and freedom may be coextensive also seems to elide the social imaginary. Although the dispossessed may enter into contracts on the basis of owning their own bodies, they are not necessarily entering contracts as free individuals. With no scope for survival based on unilateral action, they have no choice other than a mediated one, and this undermines the entire notion that they enter into contracts freely. Um, I now move on to my final section before the conclusion, my in person. So I ask the question, how does Locke's labor theory lead to dispossession in the first place? In this final section, I highlight that this is not actually the case. Perhaps the commodity lens we apply to money has obscured its nature, not as a neutral facilitator of exchange, but as a creator of inequalities in its own right. First, I assess Locke's explanation in defense of radical inequality after money was invented. Second, through a quick thought experiment, I highlight why differences in labor alone could not solely account for the transition. Third, I return to the notion of money as a social institution and a claim to provide a more plausible explanation. So. 
Locke's explanation of dispossession. Although we tend to interpret the universality of natural rights as normative for Locke, political scientist C.B. McPherson noted that Locke's only explicit moral imperative was not a right, but the prohibition against infringing on another's property rights, uh, 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 another's rights period. Arguably, Locke's universality of natural rights was merely a description of a specific point in time before the formation of the state and before money. Locke explicitly stated that it was the invention of money that led to the appropriation of the earth, leaving certain individuals propertyless. He claimed it did so by providing the industrious with the means of storing a surplus product of their labor, which before money was subject to spoilage. Locke treated money as a commodity or convention or compact, but not imposed by the state. Its invention changed man's mode of being by making individual accumulation a rational approach to existential uncertainty, leading to the full appropriation of the earth. While some were left without access to property, Locke argued that the rising tide of industriousness would nevertheless increase the common stock of mankind and therefore benefit everyone. He justified dispossession by asserting another important consequence of money. It rendered the natural right to property itself derived from the right to preserve one's life no longer universally necessary. Wage contracts were now an alternative mode of self-preservation. Unpacking Locke's labor justification of private property. But can labor alone explain the dispossession of a large segment of the population? Despite our own belief in labor as a basis for wealth, Locke is actually ambiguous on whether labor is a moral justification for appropriation or like the right to property, just a practical limitation that was also overcome with money. In any event, uh, sorry, I'm just wondering if I need to move. There we go. So, in any event, in order for money to reflect a labor basis of accumulation, it needs to function as a neutral tool per commodity theory and not itself affect the underlying real economy or social system. Only then might unequal accumulation be seen as a direct result of differences in labor. However, Locke did not legitimately detail how radical inequalities based on labor can actually come about. A certain level of inequalities arising from differences in luck, ability, and industriousness would certainly be expected, but not widespread dispossession. To better illustrate this point, I quickly unpack the two most obvious ways that neutral money might have led to accumulation, wage, labor, and exchange, and exchange to show it doesn't work. It is important to keep in mind the moment we are considering is the transition to money in the state of nature when there is still enough common land for everyone. The first possibility money offers is wealth accumulation on the back of wage labor. Locke clearly allowed this, uh, quote, thus the grass my horse has bit, the turfs my servant has cut, dot, 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 become my property, end quote. While he never explained the statement, it is clearly morally at odds with his labor theory, suggesting he did treat labor as a merely practical limitation on accumulation. However, from a purely practical perspective, wage labor begs the question, when there is land available, why would someone opt for a wage reflecting portion of output over directly laboring on common land, whereby in addition to his full output, he could also claim the land for himself. Alternatively, one might argue that radical inequality arises from advantageous market exchange transactions. For example, five labor days of potatoes are sold for gold bead, which is later used to buy 10 labor days of carrots, parlaying it into future accumulation. But in the state of nature, the cheap carrots arising from a market glut would have to be eaten or exchanged for money at the same cheap price, offering little accumulation advantage over barter. Accumulation through exchange would continue to hover around what could be produced over consumption needs and sold. Although this cursory thought experiment is not exhaustive, it serves to highlight in a more concrete manner an obvious point 
that money as a neutral commodity still limits labor-based accumulation to one's own labor. Inequality is possible, but radical inequality and dispossession appear to require a different ontology of money. This leads us to a final unexamined question in Locke's treatise. How did money become a store of value in the first place? Which leads us to credit money and radical inequality. <laughs> The appropriation of the earth seems to require the economic growth and efficiencies of a market system. Within the state of nature, Locke envisioned the production of commodities specifically for exchange that a market system entails, together with investment, wage labor, and the eventual division of labor. In the case of subsistence economies, where occasional surplus is bilaterally traded by otherwise self-sufficient individuals, an exchange of durable tokens as proposed by Locke might be imagined, but it doesn't lead anywhere. <clears throat> However, for market system relations where transactions take on a multilateral dimension and a temporal element, some stability in terms of money's purchasing power and its widespread acceptance is needed. As I have previously detailed, a commodity theory cannot explain how a stable money could evolve in the state of nature. Without it, a locking appropriation of the earth is unlikely. However, the state theory of money does plausibly explain radical unequal accumulation. The state issues its own IOUs that it accepts as payments for taxes. However, this shatters the Lockean myth as inequalities would only appear after the state was founded, in which case, the right to unlimited accumulation based on a certain form of uh, that a certain form of money enables would no longer be a natural right, but one instituted by men and therefore one that could be revised by men. The state theory also provides a viable explanation of why individuals would labor for wages or exchange goods on disadvantageous terms, which is to attain money for payment of taxes. Radical inequalities are also explained. Credit is not the temporary transfer of commodity money, which itself represents a useful but spoiling thing. In a cap, we created ex nihilo based on expectations of its eventual redemption at a profit. Through the establishment of a central bank, these private IOUs are monetized within the entire money space of the state and greatly accelerate the accumulation possibilities of those who create and control the availability of money and those who have access to credit. The created credit money does not reflect existing labor value, but the ability of individuals to repay credit by a variety of means. These individuals can acquire credit money, which will be universally accepted for the purchase of property and labor in the real economy, and on the basis of which they have the potential to further accumulate real goods and services. And I finish with my short conclusion, oh, which I don't have as a slide. <laughs> conclusion. How we made money a person? In social discourse, we tend to equate the person with an individual human being as with an individual human being with rights. However, we live under a rule of law that renders our rights effective. While there is no legal definition of human being, the legal persona does have status under one that has changed over time. In the 17th century, a legal person increasingly became the bearer of rights via contract. Arguably money, when conceived as a series of debtor creditor contracts originating with the state is a social relation that defines the rights of the persons entering into it. The holder of money has the right with respect to society to universally exchange his money for any goods and services within the given money space. Those without money are compelled to acquire it in order to mediate their survival in a market society where all common land has been appropriated. This undermines the coextensiveness of contract with free will, its original justification. Money is the most ubiquitous of all contracts and as the basis for most other contracts informs most of our other, many if not most of our other legally enforceable relationships. We see money as a neutral tool that buys us freedom by making our labor exchangeable into the goods and services that we desire. What we often fail to grasp is money's larger role as a complex and ubiquitous set of interrelated debt contracts, which binds us into a hierarchically ordered set of interdependent, impersonal relationships within the money space where it is universally accepted. 
While money enabled freedom from obligations tied to family and status, it replaced them with other ones tied to an impersonal order. He also failed to perceive that this ordering is not a direct result of our labor, but to a large extent, a matter of access to money, which is credit money created ex nihilo. A failure to clearly see the role of credit money is arguably the result of the commodity lens through which we perceive money. Our tendency to equate economic wealth with our own industriousness as per the intuitive appeal of Locke's labor theory further underscores our perception of money's neutrality. As a result, although we conceive our personhood in terms of free self-determining individuals, it is in fact to a large extent hierarchically ordered by this foundational contract of money that informs our other contract relationships in terms of our ability to enter into them and exact terms. By not seeing this, we have unwittingly accepted this state of affairs and indeed made money the de facto bearer of rights and ourselves as corporeal embodiment. Um, the end. And thank you. <laughs> and I just wanted to say at the end of all this, I'm not anti-money. I just kind of a more considered <laughs> approach to it. Thank you. Don't unmute yet. Okay. All right. I'm just going to wait, 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 wait. So for those of you who have joined us late, which is a fair number of people, because uh, uh, it's the middle of the day, um, uh, welcome. And uh, I see that Jerry's here now, George is here, oh yay. All kinds of friends uh, are, are with us now that uh, must have joined along the way. Um, thank you very much, Helen, for uh, that provocative ending. <laughs> it's a, it was uh, built it built up for a long time. It's like oh oh now I see what yeah. now I see why why I've become the corporeal embodiment of money the person. Um, but uh, I asked Ken Stickers to uh, give a response to this paper today, um, which uh, he has kindly agreed to do, and so I'm going to now turn it over to Ken. I'm going to mute myself. <laughs> Wait. I mean. Now unmute without any feedback. Can everybody? Can hear everybody me? hear me? Okay, good. good. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Uh, this is a, a real delight to respond to uh, uh, Helen's paper. We already had discovered that we were working in very similar directions, and uh, her, her paper really uh, it took this, I think, to another uh, level. So it's uh, always a pleasure to encounter a uh, kindred spirit in uh, wrestling with the same sorts of, of intellectual uh, uh, issues. Uh, in my case, the issue has been uh, how did economics sever itself from uh, moral philosophy um, out of which it was born? Uh, and how do I, uh, how does one tell that, that uh, story? And I had not, uh, well, I'd, uh, only in, very insufficiently had touched upon the role of money in telling uh, that, that uh, story. Uh, uh, so this is uh, uh, what Helen has to say is a very, very uh, important uh, addition to what I've been working on for a long time. Uh, it's also very humbling then when one expresses uh, things so much more clearly and to the point that well, one has been struggling to say for a long time. So I compliment the uh, the, the uh, clarity and. <laughs> and uh, uh, embarrassing here now, appears. Yeah. Uh, so my criticism is, uh, I uh, is is not um, anything that I particularly uh, disagree with, but uh, to simply uh, maybe supplement the story that uh, that Helen wishes to tell along uh, three three lines. Uh, and uh, so the the argument that I see her uh, presenting, if I were to summarize in my own words and for my own. Uh, purposes for the points I want to make uh, would be simply this, that in the 17th century, personhood shifts from personal relations, social status, and the obligations and rights uh, contained therein uh, that we find in ancient and medieval times uh, to a contract established uh, freely entered uh, relations uh, revolving principally upon, around debt. And out of this shift, uh, money emerges as the measure of and hence bearer of personhood, or as one puts it, money becomes a person. Uh, the, uh, so three points I would like to uh, supplement the analysis with. The first is the role of, uh, of enclosure, the whole process of enclosure that is taking place at this time, which reached its peak in the early uh, 17th century. 
And here I get my clue from um, uh, David Graeber's own uh, uh, account uh, of the debt uh, theory of, uh, of, of, of money, when he suggests that money uh, enters when bonds of trust uh, within the older gift economies uh, break down uh, and uh, persons begin keeping score. Uh, the, uh, the, the analogy that he uses is that, uh, that uh, among friends in a bar, uh, nobody keeps score uh, of the rounds uh, being bought, but when suspicions and so forth enter those relationships, then one starts keeping score. Uh, so it is uh, I, uh, with uh, Graeber, the, uh, this is the uh, origin of, uh, of money. Uh, so I want to look at then the important role of enclosure in explaining this, uh, this, this shift in the understanding of personhood uh, that within the, um, uh, the radical rupture of, of enclosure is the radical rupture of those social relations that established one's personhood or status as a person. In other words, if person is to be understood in terms of social relationships, an enclosure represents the radical rupture of those relationships, what happens to persons. Uh, that uh, persons dissolve uh, along with those uh, uh, relationships. Uh, this is what um, the uh, historian uh, Christopher Hill called in the uh, title of his famous book, The World Turned Upside Down. Uh, the world became uncomprehensible uh, through the uh, enclosure uh, movement, you know, beginning in England, but then spreading elsewhere, Germany and other parts of Europe to uh, lesser degrees. Uh, that um, uh, Karl Polanyi, I believe, uh, uh, describes uh, enclosure in the most uh, powerful and, and direct way when he, he says that uh, uh, that uh, it was not merely a, a matter of, of, of a real change, a rupture in social economic relationships, but it was a rupture in the very moral fabric of the uh, of, of the society. And so he refers to it as a catastrophic dislocation of the lives of the common people. And he goes on to say, enclosures have been appropriately called a revolution of the rich against the poor. The lords and nobles were upsetting the social order, breaking down ancient laws and custom. I want to underscore this, where he's talking about the, the rupture in uh, in the moral fabric of uh, of the society. So uh, that uh, uh, so some uh, sometimes this occurs through uh, means of violence, often by pressure and intimidation. They were literally robbing the poor of their share in the common, tearing down the houses, which by the hitherto unbreakable force of custom. Uh, that um, the uh, poor had regarded as theirs and their heirs. The fabric of society was being disrupted. Desolate villages and the ruins of human dwellings testified to the fierceness with which the revolution raged, endangering the defenses of the country, wasting its towns, decimating its population, turning the overburdened soil into dust, harassing its people, and turning them from decent husbandmen into a mob of beggars and thieves. Uh, Robert Heilbronner uh, cites uh, Queen Elizabeth I after she makes her tour of her kingdom and returns saying, what has happened to the prosperous uh, peasantry of England, the envy of all Europe? They're, they've become seemingly overnight uh, bands of beggars and thieves, a phrase that comes up over and over again beggars and thieves. Uh, Robert Heilbronner puts it this way, says the market system was born in agony. Never was a revolution less well understood, less welcomed, less planned, but the great market making forces would not be denied. Insidiously, they ripped apart the mold of custom. Insidiously, they tore away the usage of tradition, that is traditional morality. And finally, uh, uh, Arch Tawney uh, puts it very concisely. He describes um, uh, enclosure as an acid dissolving customary relationships. And as I indicated, is that if personhood is uh, uh, traditionally grounded in those relationships, then the, uh, the, the acid that dissolves those relationships also dissolves uh, the at least traditional notion of, um, of, of, of persons. Persons become individuals. That um, uh, that um, uh, so out of this uh, this this rupture, then, as I say, uh, uh, in the modern notion of individualism is, uh, is is born. So that's point number one. The supplement that I would uh, encourage Helen to look at uh, the important role of uh, of, of enclosure in uh, breaking apart uh, those social relationships, and then following up on Graeber that it's out of the severance of uh, traditional relationships uh, that money is born. Uh, money as debt is born as a way of keeping score. Uh, of, uh, of, of debt. 
Um, the second um, supplement is um, uh, um, some attention to uh, the figure of Alfred Marshall, uh, that uh, there's some discussion of uh, Menger uh, in this, uh, who is about the same time. Uh, Marshall's book on the principles of economics um, uh, precedes by two years, 1890, uh, the work that uh, uh, Helen cites. Of, of, of Menger. Uh, and I, I see that uh, uh, Marshall, I see, is, is extremely important as the culmination of uh, modern economics effort to model itself upon the natural sciences, uh, specifically uh, physics. Uh, the uh, continuing effort uh, on the part of economists uh, starting, in, well, even before Smith, actually, to make economics into an exact uh, prescriptive mathematical science. Uh, that uh, at least up until recently, that is up until the uh, the, the 2008 catastrophe, uh, virtually every uh, every uh, economic textbook, the major textbook, uh, would include in its introduction the claim that economics is the most scientific of all of the social sciences. And this claim to uh, this claim was grounded in its further claim that it was the most predictive. Uh, and with uh, <laughs> which is why this, uh, uh, why I say up until 2008, this uh, uh, was was the claim, uh, and and it was the most predictive because of its use of uh, of, of mathematics uh, modeled upon the natural sciences again, especially uh, uh, physics. Uh, so. Um, uh, uh, with this uh, this period in which the world is turned upside down, as I see it, is there's this effort on the part of moral and social political philosophers to make sense of a world that had stopped making making sense. Uh, the traditional rules of the game, the, the tradition uh, established by custom and tradition, uh, have all been shattered, and uh, one is uh, left with the feeling of uh, who or what do I trust anymore. Uh, and uh, you know, hence the rise of uh, you know, individualism, as, as, as I described. Uh, and um, uh, Adam Smith, uh, I think this is the significance of his work. Uh, I think the Wealth of Nations to be the first uh, treatise to, that began to make some sense of what the hell was happening at this, uh, this time. Uh, and um, so he, like other moral philosophers of the day, um, turn to the natural sciences for clues as to how to understand what was happening in the social, political, and economic uh, realm. Uh, prior to him was the, um, the, the, the famous uh, applications of uh, Kizne, uh, of his uh, appropriation or, or borrowing, I should say, of the, the theory of blood circulation from Harvey uh, and applying it to, uh, to economics, uh, in other words, what circulates in the body politic uh, in a way that's similar to the way in which the blood circulates in the, the human body, uh, uh, money. All right, so this is the beginning, this is the first, at least that I know of, uh, circulatory theory of money, which is still held uh, uh, today. Um, and uh, uh, Smith, however, turns to, um, uh, to Newton, uh, and I think it's well known uh, uh, how much enamored that Smith was with Newton. Uh, he praises him in the highest uh, uh, order. And uh, as I see it, um, I, I see three particular points on which um, Smith uh, is enamored with uh, Newton and why he turns to Newton, uh, wants to try to export from Newton certain principles into economics to uh, help make better sense of this, uh, of, of this uh, world that has uh, seemed to have stopped making sense. Uh, first is his uh, importation of the notion of gravity. Uh, the, um, uh, the first use of the term invisible hand uh, is actually in uh, Smith's treatise on, uh, on astronomy, in which he uh, uses uh, the term invisible hand as a metaphor for gravity, that uh, the invisible hand of Jupiter uh, keeps its uh, moons in check. Uh, and and, and uh, uh, as it is, uh, in uh, the wealth of nation, this gets turned around, and uh, the uh, that uh, gravity then is used as a, a synonym for the invisible hand. Uh, uh, and I always, you know, advise students to look at how often the metaphor of gravity appears in that work when he talks uh, about the operation of the invisible hand. Uh, market prices gravitate towards natural prices to create market equilibrium. Uh, and so, forth. so uh, this, I mean, the thinkers of the time are dealing with this general problem of causality at a distance, and um, uh, Smith is, uh, you know, picks up on the the, uh, the theory of gravity as generated by uh, by Newton. The second, and perhaps the most uh, important in all this, is the notion of the counterbalancing forces. 
which becomes in uh, in uh, uh, political and economic uh, spheres uh, the notion of counterbalancing interests. Uh, in other words, interests are the social counterpart of what physicists are talking about as uh, as as force. Uh, and uh, so we um, uh, this notion of counterbalancing interests. I mean, it's not unique at all to. Uh, and to Smith, of course, it gets picked up by uh, figures like Montesquieu and the Federalists and the U.S. Constitution. Their idea of of uh, of, of, of vision and balance of uh, of, of of power um, and so forth. But um, but it's an idea that's derived very much from uh, from from Newton um, uh, that the uh, the centrifugal force of uh, Jupiter's pat, uh, uh, moons is exactly equal to the gravitational pull. Of, uh, of the of the planet uh, Jupiter, and so it's in, within this uh, perfect counterbalancing of forces that you have uh, uh, a cosmic harmony, uh, and uh, so it is uh, with Smith. It's in the perfect balance of uh, the the uh, forces of uh, the, the interests of uh, suppliers and uh, buyers. Uh, that we find market equilibrium or a kind of social uh, economic harmony. Uh, and so you have these, these various uh, uh, parallels. Um, uh, moreover, I mean, we, this gives rise to the, the, the idea that there, there could be something like a perpetual motion machine uh, that within physics with the idea that you know, energy is neither created nor destroyed, uh, it gives rise to the idea that uh, this could be done. Uh, and uh, so within the uh, social economic sphere is that the metaphor of a perpetual motion machine is used to describe the self-regulating market within the economics. And it's also was used to describe the US uh, constitution. In fact, the commissioned uh, book on the constitution for its bicentennial was uh, uh, I believe called that a machine that would run by itself. Uh, so, um, uh, so we see you know, these, these transference of, uh, of, 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 of uh, principles. Um, so that those first two, the, you know, the importation of gravity and the idea of counterbalancing forces, uh, Smith uh, you know, achieves within the uh, Wealth of Nations uh, and, and other works. Uh, but there's another point on which um, uh, Smith is quite enamored with Newton, and that is Newton's ability to assign uh, relatively precise mathematical values to the physical forces that he has uh, uh, described. Uh, you know, formulas for uh, gravity, for uh, a centrifugal force, and, and so forth, so that these counterbalancing of forces can be mathematically uh, uh, demonstrated. Um, as far as I can tell, Smith hasn't a clue as to uh, how this idea might be imported, how, uh, uh, how economic science can be made a mathematical science. Uh, but along comes Jeremy Bentham, uh, who offers his uh, hedonic uh, calculus, and hence uh, is born in, in economic uh, terminology, the notion of the hedon or the uh, util, uh, that is the idea of a theoretical unit of, uh, of, of utility, which uh, of course Bentham equates with uh, with with pleasure and uh, and uh, and happiness, uh, all right. So um, uh, it, here it be begins the movement towards the mathematizing of, of economics. And you know, in in Bentham's hedonic calculus, you know, he offers uh, he, you know, he's trying to create this algorithm that will uh, uh, that will you know give us the 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 the, the uh, uh, net utility of uh, of any particular um, kind of consumption. Uh, you know, there's eight different factors he ultimately needs, but the the, the main two factors uh, are the intensity of a pleasure and uh, the duration of the uh, of the pleasure. Uh, now this is then the equivalent of what what do we have in physics? The foot pound. Uh, so this uh, you know gets uh, picked up. So here you have you know, with Bentham a further you know movement in this direction, but it still remains a mystery for the most part as to well what is this util or hey Don? Uh, I mean Bentham has uh, offered it as a theoretical possibility, but but in in actual uh, practice and so forth, what uh, what could this be? Uh, well, and, you know with the marginalists like Javons and and, and Edgeworth, uh, you, you see a certain. Uh, movement in this direction, but it seems to me it's really Marshall who uh, states the matter uh, most directly uh, and precisely, and that is, what is, uh, what is this util? Money. Uh, that money is a, um, uh, is a, a proxy uh, for utility. 
uh, that uh, what money represents is the expected utility that one will derive from uh, from uh, a purchase or the disutility for that matter, uh, say when when in, in terms of wages or something like that. Uh, and so uh, you know, when one spends say ten ten dollars, ten euros, uh, uh, whatever that one expects an approximately uh, ten units of uh, of, of utility, uh, sometimes more, something less, but on average. Uh, so it is. Uh, all right. So uh, this is why I see uh, you know, uh, Marshall as as, uh, as as so important in, in that he is uh, the one who assigns money. Uh, I'm telling you to that telling you you uh, certainly um, uh, you mentioned in it, and that is the uh, the utility notion of uh, of, uh, of of money. But but uh, what I'm suggesting here is seeing it within this larger picture of the history of the development of economics and its effort to become a precise mathematical science. Um, so, um, just from Marshall, um, some examples, he tells us then the price which is actually paid for a thing represents the benefit or utility that arises from it. Uh, and uh, he says money represents different amounts of pleasure to different people. Um, now we can see immediately the problem here. How can it be objective when it uh, seems to be you know, uh, relatively? Well, that's a whole other matter, uh, right there. All right, and I think you've alluded to that of this uh, uh, this tension between the uh, subjective and objective character of uh, of money, and this is uh, another way of, of looking at it. Uh, so it's with this move on the part of Marshall that uh, that economists really felt that the project was completed, uh, that uh, that uh, economics had become a precise mathematical science. Uh, uh, comparable to uh, to physics, uh, so for God's sake, they can even use calculus now. I mean, that's really working with the big boys here. You know, the, uh, when when with the uh, development of marginal theory, for example, uh, we get to use the same sorts of calculus that uh, by which gravity, for example, uh, is described and uh, and and so forth. All right. uh, the third uh, uh, supplement I'm making, I'm, I'm only going to make this only very uh, quickly, is that it seems to me that not only does money uh, become person, uh, but it at the same time effaces or conceals uh, 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 persons. And uh, the, the clue, <laughs> yeah, I, I think, of in, in making this point is, uh, is the famous uh, closing line in the original um, uh, Godfather uh, movie, as, uh, uh, as, as Michael uh, is, uh, is about to uh, kill uh, Lucia. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's nothing personal, it's only business. Um, there you have it. I mean, because what is business but money? Uh, that that the, the erasure of the person in the name of, uh, of, of money. And it gets carried out, you know, we see it throughout uh, the corporate world, uh, right? that, uh, that uh, workers are, uh, are, are laid off, fired, and, and so forth in service to the uh, bottom line. It's nothing personal, it's uh, just business. Uh, and uh, you know, in that, I think we see a, another element of uh, the way in which uh, uh, persons become individuals and uh, money becomes uh, persons. So I thank you very much, Helen, for this uh, marvelous, marvelous paper. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So uh, normally I would moderate the questions, but we can only have one computer unmuted at a time. In this, yeah. And so I'm going to ask Helen to, to moderate her own. Can you see? I don't uh, know switch, how to work Switch to the gallery <laughs> view. Okay. Um, how about how about Bob King raised his hand first, and then John DiCarlo? Well, uh, my question is if there's a place for George Simmel in this, or in the uh, mm -hmm. subsequent yeah. centuries, because he writes so in his philosophy of money, for instance, I think writes really well about money as a symbol, and and what. You know, Ken mentioned what money represents and some of this discussion is a shift from utility to symbol and symbolism is a lot more vague and data people don't like that. Uh, economists are looking for precise mathematical model, model, they like data. They don't like symbolism and language. So I wonder if, if there's a place for George Simmel, at least in a evolving discussion here. Yes. 
Uh, Myron, would you like no, to say no, something? No. Um, I have, I have, I think George Zimmel is great. I, mean, I haven't read his whole book, but I have read various chapters, including, I don't know, style of life and how it changes and, um, and other chapters. Um, I personally, I think, cause I come from the financial world. I am, I, I feel like my goal is to de, what's the word? just kind of clarify like this mystery of money, it, like not make it a mystery, almost like not like just bring it down to, <laughs> you know, what is a glass? Well, what is so, I don't know to what extent that can be done, but I, as much as I like, I think I, I'm trying to sort of figure out how, so I think central banks are good, but how they work, how the bank, you know, I'm looking at the form of money and what, and, and trying to understand how a form can can um, be more egalitarian, let's say. So while I think that that part is fascinating, I personally am going to focus on getting away from the symbol and getting it as concrete as I can possibly make it, just to demystify it, right? <laughs> so, so anyway, but I'll- so you, I'll have to, you have to mute or- Well, oh, you can oh, use mine if you, you want. want. Just, yeah. Uh, yeah. Is that, yeah, is that, that okay? Should work, yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it uh, doesn't want to. Yeah. Okay, where am I? Um, oh, there I am. You are okay. Two I'm now Helen. Okay, I see. <laughs> yeah. uh, yes, I, I mean, I think the, yes, the symbolic uh, um, value of money is uh, uh, badly uh, uh, under discussed and, and treated in, in, in the literature. Uh, in this regard, I am very much influenced by uh, Weber and, um, uh, uh, and Veblen on this, so I think offer important analysis of, uh, of that. Uh, with regard to uh, Zimmel, uh, he was one of my first, first forays into philosophy of economics uh, uh, in my efforts to apply phenomenological method to, uh, to, to economics, uh, because uh, Zimmel was uh, similarly influenced by Husserl and this off offers something of a, a genetic account of how money uh, uh, emerges out of, uh, uh, out of a barter relation. That's the problem. He assumes the, I think the barter uh, notion of the uh, origin of, uh, of, of, of money, so. Well, before you put that back, mm -hmm. Erstein has, has put something in the chat Mm -hmm. that that is a direct response to you and so maybe you do that and then john okay. has something in the chat as well this is when you said that uh 2008 wasn't predicted no. what gary said oh well it was it, for, for the most part it was not i mean it was the overwhelming but there were there were in fact economists like and dean baker is the one that is foremost in my mind but even paul krugman was was on that train as well it pointed out that the that the 2008 collapse is due to the 2007 housing collapse. And the housing collapse is due to, due to a bubble that was perfectly predictable okay. using uh, traditional economic fundamentals. And in fact, that's what Dean Baker did. He said, at least, at least as early as 2004, he said, we are in a housing bubble and this is gonna explode if we don't do anything about it. And the real estate uh, uh, industries said, uh, just went, went hysterical, said, no, no, there's no such thing. But, but you're certainly right, the vast majority absolutely denied there was any problem but when, thank you. Um, mm -hmm. But when you, sure. but when you look at, but but, but as he said, mm -hmm. I mean, you, there's this very standard measure, the, the the ratio between rents and housing prices, and this is has been is stable for over an entire century, and suddenly housing prices explode while rents are stable. That's a bubble. That's a classic bubble, and that was all due to just and only uh, economic fundamentals. But yeah, the mm -hmm. ma vast majority were driven purely by ideology. They ignored economics. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, I remember uh, I was at the American Economics Association in 2010, which was the first uh, meeting uh, you know, after the, uh, the the crash. The 2009 meeting had already been uh, uh, you know, organized, and so there were multiple uh, sessions, plenary sessions on the you know, on the uh, uh, on the crash. And uh, I remember one of them, uh, one of the uh, economists, I mean, there were a number of Nobel laureates in the room, and the one saying, now, what economic model could possibly have predicted this? And I innocently said, Marx, 
I thought I was going to get I thought I was going to get pillared, on, on that one. <laughs> but in any way, I mean that was the general sentiment um, among the Orthodox uh, crowd was that uh, that it was completely uh, you know, unpredictable. But well, I, uh, no, I'm not disagreeing uh, with the vast majority. I'm, afraid, I'm just saying. But I mean, um, Baker is not even a radical. I mean, he's just a straight up liberal. I mean, he's 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 running straight out of Keynes, basically. <laughs> anyway, well. Mm -hmm. The stack is John, and then Anthony, and then Roger. So back to oh. Helen over here. <laughs> Thank you, Helen. Okay, uh, so we all, we, I think we all share the concern that uh, things seem to be uh, out of control a bit. I, I just when I when you started when you posed the question where the money uh, has a personality, I immediately thought of when uh, the Queen gave this uh, uh, this uh, status to the East Indies uh, Company as an LLC. Right, is the, the, the this is before before these other theorists, um, and it's it's kind of ironic, paradoxical by separating the company from the people that owned it, uh, the company would not be held liable, um, and yet the people who owned it could then put their private money back into the company as an investment, but then take it out and then protect it. So in effect, the the company be, became a personality by not becoming a person, right? So I figured it was a clever stroke, brilliant stroke. Um, and then I, I just wonder, and I don't know. How to, how to, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. I'm not sure how to how that you're, fits you're, into the you're, um, your 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 connection is unstable. I missed the last few sentences. I think we all missed the last few sentences. All right, I'll I'll say it again. Yeah, so they yeah. by separating the corporation from the people who owned it and uh, uh right. and, and taking away the liability of the people involved in the corporation, the corporation inadvertently took on a personality uh in a mm -hmm. sense so i think i think that was the genesis of things uh, so i just i'll just kind of put that out there uh, other people know the historical cultural uh, context better than i the other question i have is because the, the presupposition was the transition from um tr barter to credit was was uh, was a leap of sorts. Uh, the first being more natural, the other one being a construction of sorts. I'm wondering how the the current theory of predictive mind fits into that. In terms of uh, that, if, if if the neurologists are right that we're always in, in in many different dimensions anticipating, predicting what's going to happen next, we we are maybe hardwired for credit. <laughs> in a sense um, that you know we are, I, I, I anticipate this happening i don't have the money i want credit and and it's it's good because my my brain knows how these things work <laughs> well think think about your students john they all want credit right <laughs> for everything <laughs> <laughs> you know, I had a I had a student once said uh, they had it handed no work in uh, by the end of the semester, and I said, "Well, you know, you're failing." And they said, "How can you fail me? You haven't seen my work yet." <laughs> so yeah, the uh, you know, I think Aristophanes dealt with some of these strange types of logic, right, <laughs> in some of his plays. <laughs> uh, but seriously, I, I think maybe uh, I, I was just offering. Maybe that's maybe that's more naturalistic than we think that the notion of credit that it's not a, a social construct uh, yeah well um so a, a couple of things on on the, the um the legal um the notion of a corporation and limited liability i mean it was also a good thing right because it allowed people to pull together investment and not fear that somebody will come after you if something doesn't work yeah. um so so i mean there are always two sides to these the coin i guess um but you know then you build up a whole pile of other you know as laws around it that either give it more or less protection um priority privilege so um you know as a notion money that's why i think money is a notion i mean it, it was such an amazing technology in a way and it's just kind of depersonalizing 
this trust that that allowed expansion. It's not a bad thing, but more thinking about the form of it and how it could better serve us. Um, in terms of the corporation, I just wanted to say, um, I was in a class in Warsaw, Professor of Rubel's class, and one of um, the books we read was co called Code of Capital. I can't remember who the author was. It's a very recent book, um, but that goes into kind of how, how our legal system so the code, the legal code privileges certain things, um, I, whether it's the bankruptcy code or, you know, the institution of trust, she went into corporations, just all these things, um, just how these things are constructed. And again, money, yes, I think the idea of it in trust and which preceded barter, like what Graeber said, um, um, but it's the, the codifying of it into an, imper, you know, into an impersonal, universally accepted item. Yeah, and how that did itself. So I think Anthony. Yeah. Okay, um, so uh, my, okay, hi. my question, and I'm not sure if I'm, Hello, hello, how are you doing? I, I'm not sure if I'm going to get this out uh, in a way out that uh, is sensible, but, but we, we tend to talk in abstractions. So we're, we're talking about money separate from everything else, but there are a number, a number of uh, contingencies that I think are, are uh, valuable to kind of place with this or at least important. And violence. So I, I think in some ways, how do we talk about violence? And, and certainly in this connection with the market, certainly in connection with, with uh, how money, who, who gets to have money, all of those kinds of things. How do we create new markets? Um, it, it, you know, all of those things kind of go together. Uh, formerly, I, I served in the military and I just got a chance to see firsthand how, how these things are kind of connected, who we're going to go to war with, um, the unwritten rules about who uh, debtor nations and, and how we don't go to war with certain nations because we owe them money, all of those kinds of things. So I, I'd just like to hear just a little bit about that. <laughs> okay, so I, I don't really know how to respond to that. Well, maybe you can. Yeah. All, all I want to say is my focus is kind of of just, and again, is probably what they shouldn't be doing, but just keeping almost like a modal construction and seeing what works and what doesn't work logically. So in terms of Locke's story, I was taking what he said, his fairy tale or whatever, and, <laughs> and trying to figure out what doesn't work in it logically. Yeah. So I want to yeah. uh, quickly say, yeah. Anthony, mm -hmm. my chapter in this same book is about that topic. Uh, it's, about the, uh, it's about the 17th century sort of collapse of personhood uh, when, the, when the English and the Dutch started interacting with the native peoples of Southern New England and how it and how it led to the bloodiest war on on the North American continent that we know of. Uh, a higher percentage of the population of North America died in King Philip's War than any other war in the, in North American history. And so, uh, one of the things that uh, I mean, as soon as money's on the scene, uh, as soon as wampum became money, in particular, 1651. As soon as wampum became money, the war wasn't far behind. Uh, I mean, it was uh, the, it, it, it was precipitated by competition in the wampum trade. And as soon as wampum became le <laughs> legal tender recognized by Massachusetts Bay, it was a question of time until the native peoples who made it were wiped out. Uh, and so th these things are, I'll send you the article, but the point is, is th these things are so intimately tied together. Who are we going to go to war with? You know, is it the people we owe? Sometimes if we're big enough, <laughs> You know, if we're big enough to wipe them out, then if we owe the Narragansett money, you may rest assured that's not good for the Narragansett. <laughs> and so that's the that's the kind of story I told about it. So anyway, uh, Ken has something to say. Oh, uh, I'm not sure that uh, responds. Uh, just good to see you, uh, Anthony. There, uh, and I, I just noticed that we had the, the uh, visitor from uh, uh, from Italy as well join us, uh, Jessica. Yeah, Jessica. Uh, so it's become very uh, very international. Uh, no, I don't think I have something to respond there. I, I, I guess I did want to say just something going back to the notion of, of corporation that uh, with uh, that even already in Adam Smith, 
uh, that uh, your know, corporation has a dual uh, nature, I and mean, the one that uh, was mentioned, limited liability, uh, but it also represents something like a union of merchants and manufacturers. Smith, of course, didn't have the term capitalist, but it's something like a union of capitalists uh, way of pooling their uh, resources. Uh, and Smith, uh, in both counts, uh, saw the corporation then as already a violation of the principles of, of, uh, of, of, uh, uh, of, of the invisible hand. Uh, that um, that allowed for uh, uh, unnatural concentrations of of capital, and he uh, you know he criticizes those who uh, uh, who criticize the unionizing of workers while failing to criticize the unionizing of uh, merchants and manufacturers within the structure of the uh, of the corporation. And you add to that the uh, the, the idea of limited liability. Uh, then in a truly uh, uh, a free market, as Smith described it, uh, there would be no such thing. All right. Well, I think Roger is next. Thank you so much. You know, this is this is one wonderful to, to to hear from you. And you mentioned something very early on in the Q and A, and I'm spinning in my head a thousand ways to ask the question, and I can't come up with a good one. Ted Williams analogies, you know, behind me. But what is it like coming to this material as someone who was, you know, hands in the dirt before? You know. Um, oh. <laughs> you, you said you said you said something earlier, like yeah. cleaning it up, right? And I'm just wondering if you could please expand on on that. And yeah, yeah. well, um, Randy said cleaning it up, but <laughs> I think it's trying to, trying to understand it. I certainly I was um, I went into fine into um, Wall Street, well, Chase Manhattan Bank um, in 1980 81. And um, I yeah, went through a nine month training program on, um, you know, what is a, a conservative, you know, what is a prudent loan? Um, and there was a whole bunch of other stuff. No, no, but it, okay. <laughs> um, and that was, and then there was uh, the Reaganite deregulation of the financial markets. Like when I read into it, I mean, they had it, the US kind of had to do it. It was being pushed from the city of London, but, um, Suddenly, I'm working. I'm no longer, you know, in the credit training program. I'm working, um, and everything that I was taught not to do suddenly was possible. And uh, it was um, so. I, I just that was the time, my timing. And so that was when leverage buyouts. I don't know if, who's old enough to remember when they came on the scene, and there was a, a new class of new money. Um, that came out on the back of, you know, buying companies, 90% financed by debt, and then, and then rationalizing the workforce to pay the interest expense on, you know, on the debt, uh, among other things. I mean, they made other rationalizations. Um, so that you know, I, 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 after that, and then I thought, oh my God, this is an, one was coming after another. That was the new model of finding, you know, because there was a lot of money to be made. And, and that was at the very beginnings. And we've been into it, you know, with the derivatives on top of it, and then it going international over the course of 40 years. Um, and you could see the inequality then, you could just feel it happening. Um, and that, that was the beginning of it. So, um, I can't remember what your actual question was, but I do feel- I'll, 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 Can I re-ask it just to get back? Yeah, it, it yeah, something yeah. In there. It, yeah. It, Nietzsche said, God is dead. Well, the, the 80s said the prudent man is dead. Uh, yeah. <laughs> in legal terms. Um, yeah. And uh, though the question was, when you're coming at this philosophically, and your paper was wonderful, um, do, do, do you think you have a, a kind of, a, 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 a better vision of it as somebody who worked in it for a long time. M money in particular, maybe consciousness and ethics philosophers can be expert in or something like that and talk about it more, or I don't know. Uh, but everybody's got that, right? So anybody can do it. But when philosophers talk about money and they haven't been in the finance world or something, uh, do you feel privileged? Uh, maybe that's the word, it's, um, in terms of your view of- uh, uh, my, uh, Put it this way, my my um, I had a an undergraduate degree. Um, well, I had some international economics, and then I I, I did a, a master's degree in international finance, or kind of like MBA. I know how that world thinks, right? Um, so I kind of 
my only privilege is maybe trying to figure out how I can write something so that they buy it. <laughs> uh, but but I don't so blame right. anyone. It's so full of actually really nice people. You cannot function in, in that world unless you act a certain way and that's down to laws and things. The other thing is in terms of economic and financial uh, uh, um, education, and I really like philosophy because it is all taught as dogma, right? So you don't question the theories, you just work with them, right? Um, so my only- In economics, you mean? In economics <laughs> and finance, because I did, yeah. you know, I studied finance philosophy too. Philosophy isn't taught as dogma, I hope. No, I oh, hope no. not. <laughs> so my only privilege, and, okay. and you know, I feel like this is my calling till I die, is trying to figure out how to bridge the gap. <laughs> if I talk to my, my um, business school friends, and, and they're not awful people, I feel like I'm the Marxist. And then when I talk to my philosophy <laughs> friends, I feel like I'm this awful capitalist, right? <laughs> there is a book, <laughs> but it's not easy to find. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's my only privilege. Uh, um, it's like Gary has a question. Yes, uh, Gary, hi. Gary, you're mute. Mute, yeah, I mute. I, I, mute. I clicked on the wrong button. Yeah, hi, I put my hand, I put my metaphorical hand up and then I, because I was taking these notes and I took more notes and I realized the notes were completely incoherent. So I took the hand down again, but then I put it back up so I could check a few of these. Um, one of the things that comes to mind um, when you're talking about credit and such um, and the bonds of trust, it struck me that credit comes into play when projects, things you want to do become too large for barter. And, when, and the only way credit comes into play is if money comes into play because credit and money seem absolutely well, bound together. Well, my, my kind of point in the talk was that there's all, and like Graber said that it's like barter, there wasn't, I mean, people might have exchanged surplus goods, but most exchange has always been credit. In Graber's book, he talked about um, you weren't looking for a coincidence of wants, like you had too much, so then later on the guy would owe you and give you back something, reciprocate in the future. So I think there's, I think there is that natural tendency to credit. Um, well, yeah. But when you, when you're, when, when the, when you're going, there might be a natural tendency, but when you're going to bail, say, a fleet of merchant ships, yeah, that's yeah. something you then it becomes barter for. Now the other thing I want. So the I distinction is impersonal credit, impersonal credit, impersonal. Okay. and to impersonal. have, yeah, yeah, impersonal. Yeah, let me add that to my note. The other thing I wanted to ask, though. Um, uh, it, I didn't hear his name uh, mentioned. Fernand Brodel uh, has written extensive. Fernand Brodel. Oh yes, I like him. Yes, yeah, yeah. Thank you for mentioning that. I um, I haven't read his three volumes. <laughs> well, he read, I I learned he, he, yeah. two volumes on the Mediterranean, the Mediterranean world during during the time of uh, Philip II. He refers to what he calls the long. 16th, which is basically yeah. the 16th century from the from the fall of Constantinople to the end of the 40 years 30 years war, and you know so from 1480 to uh, 1648, and then his work on capitalism is he's dealing with much the same things. At least I haven't read the entire series, and I'm hardly an expert on this stuff, but I am kind of an enthusiast for his work in history. And he does starting from this idea of, of credit bank banking, which didn't exist in the 16th century. You have other merchants who just happen to be wealthy and are agree to lend you money, and then uh, credit and then interest. And then, if you have credit and interest, debt takes on a life of its own. And at that point, money becomes a thing of itself. Yes. Yeah. So the big thing with the Bank of England versus previous, there was credit before, but it was done within a circle of personal relationships. So whether it was the Venetian bankers, right? It was in a tighter yeah, circle with the Bank of England. Really yeah. 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 And, yeah. So, and so, but these so, were all a, a collective of merchants who got together yeah. and agreed to lend money. I yeah. mean, the Milanese bankers owed Philip's uh, squishy bits for a whole century there. Mm -hmm. Philip of Spain. Yeah. yeah, yeah. 
So we have five folks in the room here, and we're going to get an opportunity to, to ask Helen questions after the session ends. But I thought that if uh, any of them uh, had something that they wanted to ask now, uh, okay. So mute you. Sabrina's coming to my. Are you muted? Uh, let me let me mute. While I appreciate your intermingling of uh, philosophical economic um, history and mention of Graeber's uh, book on debt. Uh, one thing comes to mind uh, a little bit at the beginning of the talk, you talked about the idea of contrast and this sort of relating between the money, of, idea of money, personhood, and implied, I guess, you've got corporate body with the contrast. Uh, one thing comes to mind and maybe pull in a little bit more linkages is with law. And I'm thinking in the context of US law, but certainly there's much more international law and other countries law and corporate personhood. And so in mm -hmm. our own US history, we've got the Declaration of Independence and our Constitution that spells out rights for certain people. And you did mention that there are just that element of certain people because women and kids and uh, well, landless well, and it. other people. Well, that was wrong. That was and wrong. All <laughs> sort of didn't count even at yeah. the beginning of yeah. US history mm -hmm. as was I guess the case yeah. further back in Rome and yeah. other places in Europe. But you also have the establishment of personhood through precedent in law that uh, groups back going to the time of Occupy and the examination of uh, corporate law relative to certain extractive industries in our country and abroad uh, further spelled out their personhood as opposed to individual people who they considered assets. And it might be another article to write about this reverberation between law establishing um, corporations as personhood. Yeah, I think it's I think and it's the people as assets. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's an excellent point and I like that, the corporation as having legal personhood and then people as assets. And I think it would make a great paper. Um, I think once you start thinking about money, as not neutral and like not thinking about it. I almost feel like when you had the language turn um, in philosophy where everybody took language um, for granted because you're in it. So I almost feel like we're also floating in this world of where everything's mediated by money, like it was mediated by language. And once you think about things that way, um, then it, it opens up all these kinds of things. And the legal side, I find fascinating fascinating too and, and and that is a big part of it um that i don't you know we'll see i'm trying to keep my own little niche but i, I totally agree with you and this book by somebody kindly put down here the code of capital mm -hmm. how the law creates wealth and inequality by katarina Pistor, um is thank you jerry g Alex, for putting it down um, um so so for sure that's a, a great idea um maybe Looks like Gary's got his hand up again, and Jerry says thumbs up. <laughs> okay. Um, so Gary, um, oh, yeah, um, um, demute. I did. <laughs> yes. Um, okay. Yes, I hear you. Things, Are we here? Yeah. yeah uh, it, 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 there's a time lag. Um, the uh, John earlier he had to leave because of a graduation. Uh, John DiCarlo made the point about the predictive brain, and there was. I just remembered I wanted to comment on that. We are not. We are, we the predictive brain is a real thing because we, we throw a rock and we predict where that rock is going going to go. We shoot a bow or throw a spear or toss a feather around or something. We predict where that's going to go. We are terrible at predicting money because money didn't exist when our brain was being evolved. Money grows, economies grow. They aren't a static thing. They, we don't throw a dollar and it just it it actually gets it's like throwing a rock, but the rock gets bigger after we throw it. Um, and we're not, and we're not built to predict this kind of thing. 
And so one of the problems is that people think they understand money because they handle it all the time. We don't, we don't we're, we're worse at money than we are at statistics and we are terrible at statistics. And I just wanted to add that in, but unfortunately John went away, but I still wanted to add that in. We're terrible at understanding money. We have, there's nothing built into our biology for understanding this. And we think it's so simple. We think it's so obvious and it's not. So I'm sorry, I'm rant done. Mm -hmm. No, thank it, it looks like Professor Kilinovsky and Roger Hunt are talking about Yeah. <laughs> Yes, I've read. I've read the book. It's. It's. I. I really. I mean, enjoyed. It. I don't agree with him, <laughs> but it gives you. You know, gives you. Uh, you can go through the history of it. I mean, I read it a long time ago, so I can't. I can't remember exactly, but I have it annotated. Do my my dissertation. I will go back to it. It's good for like points in history. Yeah. All right. Well, it feels like we might be coming to a natural end here, and so, um, and so, <laughs> everybody. Uh, <laughs>